thank you to to both projects for inviting me to give uh, this uh, this uh, talk. So um, I know most of you because I'm involved in some way in uh, in both projects. So uh, so I'm going to talk uh, um, a little bit about uh, challenges and possibilities for wireless connectivity on the path beyond 5G. I didn't put 6G in the talk, uh, although everybody talks about it these days. But of course, it's implicit that one of the one of the next steps might be the next G. Although there are people that claim that uh, 5G was the last G that we have seen. Uh, and I'm I'm in the talk. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, machine learning, and I'm not going to talk about drones because these are the things that you are going to hear quite a lot today and uh, and I guess tomorrow. Uh, but I'm going to, to give uh, uh, a, a little bit of con theoretic picture on what is what is happening with connectivity beyond uh, beyond 5G. So the uh, the outline of my talk. Uh, I just uh, take off the video because it might distract you. So I, I, the, the the outline of my talk is that I'm I'm going to talk first about connectivity types. Uh, and then what are the challenges in uh, in that direction? Then I'm going to talk about the concept of spectrum slicing. Uh, and then two uh, fundamental aspects of uh, connectivity. One is timing and one is uh, space. And finally, I'm going to speak about distributed ledgers, smart contracts, IoT, and how is that related to, to connectivity. So, uh, so the... One thing is that uh, the the ecosystem of connectivity is becoming very complex because we're having a lot of different connections with uh, very different, very diverse requirements. Somebody wants rate, somebody wants many devices in, uh, connected, somebody wants low latency, and so on. So uh, this uh, this means that in principle you can develop for each requirement a separate communication system. But for example, the success of internet is let's say architectural because there was an architecture to support many different types of connectivity. So following this architectural success of, of, of the internet, we can say, okay, we can also take a very systematic approach to address this uh, connectivity ecosystem and simplify. So as we know, as all of us know very well, 5G deals with this complexity by segmenting it into three different connectivity types. Enhanced mobile broadband, Massive machine type communication and ultra reliable low latency communication. But I think that the main innovation of 5G is to offer a platform that is going to support these heterogeneous services. So, so not, su not supporting each of them individually, but having a system level platform that is going to adapt to all of these uh, requirements. And just a brief um, uh, reminder of how these requirements are uh, EMBB is a kind of acceleration of 4G, high data rate, uh, looks into the, into the transmissions which use relatively large data packets active over a long periods. And the, ob the, the, the objective is to maximize the rate while the reliability per a given packet transmission may be moderate. Then we have massive machine type communication where uh, the simple model of this is to say that we have a large uh, set of, of uh, devices connected to a base station or to the wireless infrastructure. And at a given moment, uh, the, the, sub, the, the subset of devices that is active is unknown. Then what we want to uh, maximize is the arrival rate. So in principle, the activation rate of different subsets, while the each transmission of each individual device may be with relatively low reliability. Then uh, we have a URLC where we have intermittent transmission, so we have uncertainty about the activation of the device, but this is happening from a much smaller device set compared to MMTC. So the, 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 the objective here is to offer very high reliability for the packet transmission while being localized in time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that if we have high reliability within a short time and relatively small data packet, uh, that we just have few symbols to transmit because in th this, this actually depends on the bandwidth. So if we just allocate more bandwidth, then we are going to have more symbols to transmit. So this is, so, so we need to specify all these things in order to, to claim, for example, that we have just few symbols for transmission with high reliability. So the space of uh, 
connectivity service should the services should be understood as a combination of these three. So uh, we should not really uh, think that uh, the devices will be ex exclusively dedicated to one type of service, but we are going to have communication setups which are combining these uh, three services. Uh, for example, we can have industrial automation where we have uh, devices that uh, generate traffic that is of low latency, but occasionally they generate uh, sensory traffic, which is uh, not of uh, critical importance. And from occasionally they can also generate video, which requires uh, high, high, high bandwidth. So, uh, the, the, so the main point is that's what I'm saying uh, is that with this platform approach, where we are trying to address this complex connectivity space, which I mentioned at the beginning, by uh, uh, giving uh, three, let's say, Lego bricks, URLC, MTC, and MBB that you can use to build any service you want. The question is, uh, nobody has actually theoretically proven that these three bricks are sufficient. So this is something we are going to question now. So uh, the, the 5G community has opted to couple the ultra reliability and low latency into URLC. So for a long time, the, the, the sole requirement was to have this error rate of 10 to the minus five per packet transmission and uh, this proverbial one millisecond. So what was the idea behind this one millisecond? The idea is that you have a system that has an end-to-end -end latency. Uh, and this end-to-end -end latency is uh, consuming, uh, for example, uh, time for compression, for computation, uh, and, and all other operations that are in the system. So what we're saying is that uh, let's let URLC cut off a uh, predictable small part of this latency budget, which is one millisecond, then we have the freedom to do whatever we want with the other part. I'm not sure this is optimal because uh, it, in, in many cases, the wireless link will be the one which is the most difficult to satisfy. So we need to be able to trade off latency budget between different components of the system. And uh, if, you, if you look into the basics of information theory, actually there is, it's possible to get perfect reliability under two conditions. One is that the sender knows exactly the channel statistics. So it knows exactly what the channel is and has a proper code book to select the rate that is below the channel capacity. If we do that, and if we allow infinite asymptotically large number of symbol transmissions, then we can have perfect reliability. So, so the, uh, the point is that these assumptions are very theoretical. So we, can, we, we cannot have infinite latency and we cannot have perfect knowledge of the channel statistics. But uh, so, so all, all that we are going to get in practice is an approximation of this. So what I'm trying to say is the, that the, uh, the latency uh, requirement and the constraint requirement is, is, is necessary in order to have a meaningful definition of reliability problem. But um, th th it is possible under certain condition to, to achieve arbitrarily high, high reliability. So, uh, uh, if we look into not ultra reliable low latency communication, but ultra reliable communication without imposing low latency, actually that is how we have started to look into this type of communication long ago, uh, nine, 10 years, uh, when we were defining what is uh, what is uh, the, the connectivity mode with high, high reliability in 5G. So one was ultra reliability over a long term where the latency was larger than 10 milliseconds. And the other was ultra reliability over short term where the latency is less or equal than 10 milliseconds. So we still need this latency constraint, but it doesn't need to be one millisecond. And as we are going to see later in the talk, it doesn't need to be a latency constraint. It can be a different type of timing constraint. And uh, this is visible in the 5G requirements uh, posed by 3GPP, which are revising uh, the strict latency constraint and are actually defining other types of timing measures. So uh, there are at least three cases that one can think with that, that require longer term ultra reliable connectivity. One is mobile health and remote monitoring. The other is disaster and rescue. And also the smart grid where in, in the smart grid, let's say the grid operates at uh, 50 Hertz. That means that uh, the important events happen with a latency of uh, 20 milliseconds. If you look into industrial connectivity, the 5G Alliance for industrial connectivity is defining different notions of real time. So there is a non real time, which is uh, in terms of seconds. There's soft real time, which is in uh, approximately a second, and there's hard real time, which is milliseconds or microseconds. So they're, they're actually defining this in, in this report. I, 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 I think it's, it's a very interesting read that is classifying different types of, uh, of, of, of connections. So with this, 
I think we can revisit the connectivity space. Instead of having three, we can have four dimensions. So we have a reliability, latency, data rate, and massiveness. So if you look into tactile robotics, in tactile robotics, we have high reliability, low latency requirements. So here we have actually the URLC. We have data rate, which is relatively low, massiveness, uh, relatively low. But then we have health monitors where we have high reliability, but latency is not critical. Then we have low data rate and, and high massiveness. And then we have augmented reality, which is kind of opposite. We want low latency, but it's not uh, mission critical. So uh, having said this, uh, the, the, one of the uh, challenges will be how to combine and how to characterize this uh, composite traffic. For example, we need to understand the connection ecosystem in a sense of how these generic types of connectivity are combined in order to produce a communication service uh, that is more complex. So uh, if we have a composite, composite connection is, for example, that you have a low latency traffic, uh, like in virtual reality, where certain actions are going to lead to the change in the scene. So if you have a certain, for example, we are turning or we are doing some move, and then based on that, there is a broadband image or video coming, right? Because of the change of the scene. The point there is that we are going to have a strong correlation among different packet arrivals and different uh, traffic types. So uh, this is one challenge that can be addressed by machine learning methods because it, it's very complex in a sense that uh, if we understand what is the dynamics and the statistics of the traffic where these are combined, so we can predictably allocate resource. So for example, instead of allocating uh, low latency resources for URLC that are constantly uh, uh, reserved, this reservation can be flexible based on the prediction of what is going to happen based on the current traffic pattern. For example, if we have a scene change, we know that there will be no low latency interaction, there will be video transmission. So we're using all resources for video transmission. So I think uh, there, is a, there is a need to understand this uh, composite uh, space of connectivity. And that would be, what I, I think, one of the important research areas uh, beyond 5G. So to illustrate it, there has been uh, some claims at some point that we can have a traffic that is simultaneously uh, massive and ultra reliable. So this is a little bit of a, of a paradox because if we are capable to offer uh, ultra reliable low latency for massive number of devices, then it should be a piece of cake to offer it for few devices, right? So when does it make sense to, uh, to offer, to consider simultaneously massiveness and ultra reliability? So when the information across the devices is correlated. So let me give you a simple communication model we have used to, to illustrate this. So let's say that you have uh, sensors or devices that are uh, sending say, sporadically, semi-periodically, certain individual sensing messages, for example, uh, sensing the local temperature, sensing, uh, sending a battery state uh, or, or similar. So these are quasi-periodic messages. Let's call them massive connectivity message. But all these devices have a sensor that is monitoring a certain physical phenomenon. Let's say it's fire or flood or oil spill or whatever. Then uh, if the physical phenomenon occurs, then all the devices that are going to detect that phenomenon are going to send the same information and they want to send it with high reliability. So in principle, you have a massive device set uh, that can turn into massive number of antennas associated with the physical phenomenon. So the key point there is how, uh, how the system can transfer from one mode to another mode. So from massive uh, connectivity mode or sending independent messages towards a connectivity mode where it, trans it, it supports ultra-reliable connectivity and sends information about the physical phenomenon. Right. So you can see that in the first case for massive connectivity, the information content from the set is large because there is a, let's say, information data generation at each point. In the second case, the information content is low because there's a single phenomenon that wants very reliably to be conveyed to the, to the uh, wireless infrastructure. So one thing is, that, is, uh, that is important is to always look back in the history and see what we can learn from there. So uh, it seems that we have seen something similar before to what 5G is doing. So people that have been longer in the business will remember that in the 90s, there was a popular research topic on asynchronous transfer mode, ATM. And the idea of 
ATM was great, was uh, uh, going into very reliable fiber networks. How can we use these fiber networks to support various types of services? And, uh, but, but, and each, so they're, they're defining the, the Lego bricks there are small packets uh, of uh, 53 bytes. And then with, uh, by scheduling these small packets, you could support any type of service with any basically latency guarantees. There was no reliability issue there because these networks were reliable. So that was, a, that was one very different thing. And uh, so, so the idea in ATM was to have small packets and achieve statistical multiplexing of four service types, constant bitrate, variable bitrate, available bitrate, unspecified bitrate. So I'm not saying it's the same as 5G, but it's the same the similar pl platform approach of building composite service services based on uh, on uh, on generic type of services. The big difference is that the ATM services are multiplexed over reliable optical networks, while the 5G services are multiplexed over a shared spectrum. And that brings me to the next point: What is a spectrum slicing? So if, uh, uh, if you have read last year, the topic listed by the EU Commission for Smart Connectivity Beyond 5G, for, which was a call for projects for 6G, uh, the first topic that was listed in the requirement was provision of seemingly infinite network capacity, including innovative spectrum user management. And of course, we know that infinite network capacity is a, network, infinite network capacity is a, is a marketing term. But still, uh, it seems that we are pointing out to a certain spectrum capacity. So how much the spectrum can carry data? Traditionally, we speak about spectrum efficiency. The more bits we send over the spectrum, the better. But uh, how do we measure the spectrum capacity when one user wants a high rate and another user, user doesn't want a high rate, that was a fixed rate, but wants a low latency and high reliability? So, Optimizing the spectrum in a traditional way would mean that we should allocate everything to the broadband user because the broadband user has data to fill out the spectrum. But if we want to satisfy the reliability, the, sorry, the service requirements of both users, then we have to look into how we satisfy the broadband user and how we satisfy the low latency critical connectivity user. And what is spectrum slicing? Slicing is sharing of the spectrum resources while providing heterogeneous guarantees to different services. So this is a simple communication theoretic example we have used in, uh, in a paper with my colleagues where we've developed a communication theoretic model of 5G system. Then the idea is how to characterize the performance of these systems that caters to all heterogeneous requirements. So a typical uh, performance indicator would be that we would like to see how, uh, how the data rate of EMDB depends on the rate of arrivals of MMTC. So, what are, so, so how many arrivals of MMTC can be supported and how much the data rate of EMDB is sacrificed if we support more arrivals. Uh, so that means that if we have a spectrum chunk which is allocated for, uh, let's say these 5G services, we can divide it in a orthogonal way and give something to EMBB, something to ULC, something to MTC, or we can mix them non-orthogonally. And the question is, which of these two ways is more efficient in using the spectrum? So to illustrate why this is interesting and why I, I believe it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new paradigm of spectrum usage, let's take a simple example where we have a base station. We have one user that is broadband and one that is uh, ultra-reliable low latency. And then the broadband user has continuous transmission, for example, video stream, the target is to get a rate. There's a low latency connectivity for the other one, intermediate transmissions, reliable control and target latency that, uh, and reliability, not really the rate. So this is a worked out example from the book I published recently that there's a, there's a whole chapter that, that there's part of a chapter dedicated to this uh, example and this uh, uh, performance indicators. So let's take the orthogonal slice. So we allocate, we take a single frequency channel just to simplify things. So we, we take this single frequency channel, we allocate, we take four uh, slots in this example, and we allocate three slots to the broadband user, one slot to the low latency user. 
And this is uh, for sure slicing because the performance of these two users is isolated. So the, 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 the every health or every fourth slot here is allocated to the intermittent user. And this user waits at most L slots to deliver the packet. The broadband good put is L minus one divided by L multiple R. And the important point in this orthogonal allocation is that the intermittency of the URLs user doesn't affect the broadband user. So the, 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 the uh, in the URLC user can be active or not, the uh, broadband good put stays to be L minus one divided by L multiple R and vice versa. So whatever the EMBB user transmit, transmit doesn't affect the low latency user. And this is a isolation. We are orthogonally isolating the users. Let's now take uh, change a little bit the assumption. So we say that the EMBB user, we do not want the EMBB user to have a perfectly reliable transmission. So we can allow some error there. So we are saying that uh, the EMBB user allows sharing the resources with the URLC user, but now the EMBB user also sacrifices the rate. So the rate of the EMBB user is sacrificed by having uh, each packet repeated three times. So, we are, so, so in this case, whenever we have a collision, for example, of the packet uh, Y1 with Z1 here, the, recept the, the receiver will immediately uh, the recover the packet Y1 because it has the Z1 packet from before. So it can use successive interference cancellation. On, uh, on the other hand, this packet Y2 cannot be immediately recovered, but it has to wait the, 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 the receiver to get Z3 here, and then here it will recover Z3 and then Y2. So the thing is that here we are allowing a latency which is shorter than the one before at the expense of the decrease of the rate of the broadband user. So, so we cannot directly compare what is better. We are just saying that this non-orthogonal operation has enabled a regime which is not possible in the orthogonal case. And that's important because we are talking about uh, spectrum, uh, efficient spectrum usage, uh, spectrum capacity that is satisfying the um, requirements of uh, heterogeneous users. So this would mean that if we would like to sacrifice the rate of a broadband user, then the spectrum should be able to accommodate more low latency user. This is in a very simple example. And then I'm going to show later on about how this behaves when the timing requirements of the uh, intermittent user is, 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 is different. But in, in general, uh, the outlook on the spectrum usage is that we have spectrum regulation, which is, like, which is something which is changing over a very long time. So we can see a spectrum regulation almost as a axiom of the wireless system. So we say, this is the way you should build your system. This is what you need to respect. And then we are doing the wireless system design based on these wireless axioms. Then we are coming up with new models, such as the one that I have shown. And these new models are showing us new trade-offs based on heterogeneity. Hopefully, the better we understand these new trade-offs, the, the, the more there will be new methods of allocating the spectrum. So rather than uh, having uh, the, the spectrum allocated currently with licenses, uh, which are, uh, I don't know, national and so on. So we are moving now towards private uh, licenses, but maybe we can also have uh, spectrum allocation where the users can bid in real time about their heterogeneous requirements and then share between operators or in between private network or similar. Let's look into the timing issue. Um, so the latency character, uh, reliability uh, can be characterized with a single graph they have, uh, in, in the following way. We put the latency on the X axis and the reliability or the probability that the packet is going to arrive by a certain time on the Y axis. And this can be plotted for fixed data size. So any communication system uh, where the packet is ready for transmission at time zero, you can represent it in this way. And uh, the objective in, ultra, in an ultra reliable low latency system is to introduce diversity and move from the blue to the red curve. So meaning that we want, uh, we can add the diversity in time, like for example, coding or repetition, but that is problematic because we want low latency. Then we can add uh, the diversity in frequency. 
so we can add more bandwidth in order to uh, improve reliability within a given latency time. And this is fine, but expensive because the bandwidth can has to be used also for other purposes. Then we can add more antennas uh, to improve the reliability. And the problem with the antennas is, is, is that is a degree of freedom, which is great provided that you know the channels. So, so you have to, so if you use multiple antennas, you have to spend resources to estimate them, uh, which is consuming time and, and actually is deteriorating the reliability because unreliable estimation of the channels, and uh, for example, in massive MIMO may deteriorate the, perform deteriorate the performance and not leading to the outage performance that you, you wish. And then you can also use multiple interfaces, but then it means, that, for example, you're duplicating the packet over Wi-Fi and cellular, but then it means that you're not using this interfaces eff efficiently because you're sending the same uh, data. So if we look into the design targets, traditionally, again, think that this is for a fixed uh, data packet. These curves are for fixed, for fixed size of a data packet, for example, of 64 bytes. So in broadband rate-oriented systems, the objective is to go from the blue curve to the red curve, in the sense that going from the blue curve to the red curve is going to decrease the uh, average time for packet delivery, which means that this is increasing the throughput. On the other hand, in ultra reliable low latency, we are, we, we are moving from the blue curve to the red curve, where the red curve is meeting certain reliability and timing requirements. And these two look the same. The point is that this requirement can be met also by the green curve. So what is the meaning of the green curve here? The meaning of the green curve is that we are not optimizing the system to be able to offer arbitrarily low latency, but we are optimizing the system to work well at the desired latency. So think of the uh, Shannon's communication model and coding. So the main innovation, I would say, of that uh, communication model was that Shannon is saying is that if you have unreliable channel, you should not send the bits independently one by one, but actually you should group them make a code word and send that. So that means that you are not having latency which is lower than the latency of a code word. But when the code word arrives with certain latency, the reliability will be high. And you can apply this principle also to access protocol, for example, with successive interference cancellation or similar. So to understand the basic trade-offs, let's, uh, let's look into what are, the, what are the elements of it. Let's take a single link single packet transmission, let's fix the latency to T, let's fix the data size to D. That means that the minimal required rate that this system should support, this link should support, sorry, is uh, D divided by T bits per second. Then let's fix the bandwidth to B. This gives us two BT channel uses, like two BT degrees of freedom or two BT symbols. That means that the rate per bit per symbol or per channel use is, uh, the, the, the rate per bit per second divided by the two times the bandwidth. So this tells us that if we increase the bandwidth, then the, uh, the load per individual symbol is lower. That means that the transmission of the individual symbols becomes more robust. So in, in introducing bandwidth is, is going to improve the reliability. Then if we speak, fix the energy which is spent in T, which means the energy spent in T means that uh, we can fix the SNR, we can fix the number of antennas we're using, the processing circuits and so on. And then if we all fix all these four things, then the maximum reliability is given by the fundamental information and communication theory, which tells what is, what, what is the best you can achieve in terms of reliability. So in ultra reliable low latency, you can actually fix uh, the reliability, fix the time, and then you uh, fix the data, for example, it was 32 bytes in the standardization, then uh, you can actually work with the bandwidth and energy to, to meet the, uh, the this latency and reliability requirement. But latency is not the only requirement. So latency, think how latency is measured. When we, 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 uh, we are having a packet at a given transmission layer at time zero, and this packet should be delivered to the other side. But if we, we can also look into the overall process about how this packet is generated. So how, uh, for example, a sample from a physical system is measured. And in that case, we can look into the uh, transfer interval, for example, of the vertical application between, uh, between two instances. 
we can look into the end-to-end -end latency or the total transmission time from the moment certain automation function is initiated until it's received at the other side. Or we can have, for example, what is called peak age of information. Peak age means that uh, how old is what is it, how, how old is the update that you have at your destination when the new update arrives. So, uh, so this age of information became very popular in the uh, recent years because it's uh, it stands for information freshness. So latency performance is historically characterized with the packet delay. So we're saying that the latency, as I said, is measured with respect to the packet, which is already generated and ready for transmission. But age is with respect to an external system, which has to be measured, sampled, data created for it, and then you know, transmitted to the other side. Uh, tracking applications like uh, airplane, airplane uh, tracking are sensitive to the freshness of information rather than to the latency. Uh, so the age of information and its byproducts are better to capture the freshness of information. So the thing is that uh, here we are showing this uh, age of information, which means that update arrives here at time T1 uh, at the destination. Uh, so this, sorry, T destination one, this means that this update was generated at time T1 before. So when it arrives, the age is equal to this difference then the, a, the information is aging and then new information is coming. So it uh, uh, for, comes down. So this here, these vertical lines, these are the peak age of information. And there's an indication that this peak age of information is related, for example, in control systems is related to the stability performance of the system. And uh, we can, uh, so normally in, in traditional latency, we look into exogenous sampling, meaning that exogenous sampling is that the data is generated by somebody given to you and then given to the communication system and the role of communication system is to send the data to the other side. Controlled sampling is that the communication system can decide when to generate the data. This is called generated will. And in this way, optimize when the update will be uh, freshest at the, at the destination. So uh, this is one case study we have done in my group where we have looked into the edge computing so for example, we have a sensor transmitting data to a base station and the base station features edge computing server. And then in this case, what we want to see is how, uh, what is the distribution of the age of information at the, uh, at the output of the processing, uh, of the edge processing. So uh, we have considered, for example, exponential transmission time at, for, for the sensor, which is emulating uh, the uncertainty of the uh, the uncertainty of the packet length, the uncertainty of the wireless channel, and so on. And it's just a good approximation, let's say, of it. And uh, we have taken, for example, that the, uh, the, the, the service time at the edge is deterministic. So we have seen what, how does this affect the freshness of the final product that comes out of the, uh, of the edge computing and compute the distribution of it. Uh, there are a lot of research groups working on this. And one notable work is the work of uh, Ali Matuk and his, co uh, his uh, collaborators that have worked on the age of incorrect information. So the idea in age of incorrect information is, is very intuitive that, uh, that you should not penalize for old information if the state of the source has not changed. So if, if even if the information is old and the state has not changed of the uh, of, the, of the transmitter, then it's actually fine. So you're only penalizing the, uh, the state when the information is changing. So the question here is how the destination knows that the information has changed, because if it knows that it has changed, then it will know the information. So to be consistent here, this age of incorrect information is calculated at the source, right? So that's then the source can calculate how much uh, age uh, is, uh, what is the quality of the information at the destination and decide when to do the transmission. Then uh, something we have done in my group to change the communication models is to introduce pool-based communication and investigate what is the timing and the measure of age in, that, in those models. So the common communication models are push-based. So this is true, although we don't really always think about it. For example, take Shannon's model. In the Shannon model, uh, the sender knows exactly that this information which the sender has 
is interesting for the receiver. We do not question that. And also the sender knows that the receiver needs the information exactly at this time. So we had, so the Shannon, uh, the, 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 the Shannon's uh, model, you can think of it as a, as a movie that starts at the moment when everything has been agreed. Like the sender, the receiver is clear, the interest in the message, the sender has selected the message and so on. In reality, we also have uh, cases with pool-based communication where the reading process is different from what the database researchers call permanent subscription. So in Shannon's model, we can say that we have a permanent subscription, meaning that whatever the sender sends is interesting for the receiver. But if you have, for example, satellite-based systems, then we do not have permanent subscription, but the, only when the satellite is above the nodes, then they can actually transmit uh, update or whatever information to the, to the satellite. Or we can also have cloud-based queries to edge devices where we do not, uh, uh, where the cloud is not constantly interested in the information, but there are query times where the cloud collects information and then we should, uh, we should have information ready for that time. So what we have asked in this uh, recent uh, paper, uh, which is actually to be presented at ICC soon, is how the age of information, how the timing, how the freshness of information is changed when we consider pool-based communication. So if we know the query times in advance, then if we have permanent query transmission, but we, we disregard these query times, then we're going to try to uh, optimize the average age at the destination. But if we know when the queries are arriving, we know when the satellites are arriving, we know when the, when the database is sending the query, then actually we can make the queries, we, we can make the transmission so that at the query time, the, 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 fresh, the, the update is uh, freshest. So this is illustrating it here. The blue line is having actually a lower average age, but the, the red line is optimizing the uh, the age at the time of query. It's always less than the other one. And um, <clears throat> coming back to the spectrum slicing issue, we could generate, in the previous case, I had, a ca I had a strategy where the EMBB was repeating the packet three times. So you can generalize this. And you say that the EMBB packet is, uh, the EMB transmission is using erasure code. So it's uh, transmitting N packets but only k of them needs to be decoded to, to decode the information. And then, if you, if, uh, then we can have the URLC user or the intermittent user sending uh, its, uh, its packet, which are colliding. So the point here is that whenever there is a collision, there is the, the packet is erased, but because we have erasure code, we can recover the uh, EMBB packets. And then after canceling, we can recover the uh, intermittent packets, right? So, we, so this is a more general way of uh, slicing the, the frequency resource. But what we have investigated is, what is the impact if the intermittent user has requirements in terms of latency versus what is the impact if the intermittent user has requirements in terms of age, in terms of freshness? And here is the result. I'm just uh, briefly comment on this, is that on the x-axis is the activation probability per slot. And on the y-axis is the uh, 90th percentile of the, of the latency. So uh, if you look, for example, this is the orthogonal way. The orthogonal is saying that uh, it can support uh, certain latency uh, and when the activation probability is increasing. But when the activation probability increases above a threshold, which is based on the orthogonal uh, allocation of resources, then uh, it cannot support it anymore. Simply, there are not sufficient resources there. On the other hand, if you have non-orthogonal access and you allow a capture effect, then you can actually allow much uh, larger region of, uh, of user activity pro, uh, act activation simply because uh, uh, it, the, it, with intra-slot successive interference cancellation, we can decode uh, both the broadband and the low latency user. For the age, the, the, the trend, is a little bit uh, more monotonous that uh, if we have a higher activation probability, then uh, the age is decreasing constantly. But this is expected because if we have higher activation probability of the intermittent user, that means that the, the, we are more frequently sending the updates. And this is what matters rather than whether you're using it uh, orthogonal or non-orthogonal. So, um, 
some remarks on the timing is that the latency age and peak age are only instances of, of time related criteria for mission fulfillment in the system. And for example, in control engineering, the, the, the in network control, they are using another criterion, which is called consecutive errors. So if you look into the, if there are K consecutive errors, then the system shuts down or analysis failure or similar. It, as a final remark on this, there's a trade-off between good architecture and flexible timing requirements. So the strict layering approach, which I mentioned at the beginning where, of URLC, where URLC takes always this one millisecond out of the total latency budget might not be optimal approach because the timing requirements of the applications may be different. So, um, Jimmy, how much I have more? Five, 10 minutes? Well, you have until 10.30. Okay, but I, I'll try to wrap up in six, seven minutes because- Okay, fine. Um, let's look into the space issues. So, uh, so here, so what I mean by space, I do not mean new space as communication with satellites only, but I mean the spatial processing. So uh, we have systems with a massive number of antennas. And originally these systems appeared at massive MIMO, but then we had the concept of large intelligent surfaces. And now the very, very popular concept of a configurable intelligent surfaces. The point is, how are we going to use these uh, methods to support the three connectivity types of 5G or multiple connectivity types that we are going to define, let's say, with the 6G. Uh, for massive bio and IoT, the pros are that there is a, there are very high SNR links, which are quasi-deterministic and offer immunity to fading, uh, and that's good for high reliability. While for uh, massive connectivity, what is good is to have extreme spatial multiplexing capability. On the other hand, uh, these are the pros. The cons are that there's a very expensive CSI acquisition procedure in uh, massive MIMO, and there are additional protocol steps, and each of these steps might fail, which is deteriorating the reliability. So one thing we have considered in our group was uh, to use predefined spatial channels, for example, in uh, factory scenarios, where instead of estimating all the channels uh, for, for, uh, for the massive number of antennas, we're using certain learned uh, spatial channels that, through which the signals are propagating and in this way uh, achieve, uh, achieve uh, reliability with spatial processing. Uh, then, of course, this idea could be applied if you're using uh, also uh, configurable intelligence surfaces. Uh, uh, another way in which we can think of the reconfigurable intelligence surfaces is that uh, they could, of course, they have been used to direct the propagation paths within a given environment and help uh, help steer the transmissions of the devices. For example, if we have IoT devices, then the uh, risk can, can uh, direct towards the base station and, and, and help in this uplink uh, reception. So in principle, simple IoT devices can benefit significantly from the favor favorable wireless environment created by the risk. So one case that we have considered was uh, a satellite uh, IoT, where we have a satellite Passing, uh, passing above a LEO satellite. And then the satellite has a predictive mobility. So what we have done is made, uh, made a time model of the reconfigurable intelligence surface. So all the reflection coefficients are changing to track the satellite. So uh, depending on, uh, because this mobility, we have used the fact that the mobility is predictable. Uh, you could use this in principle with drones if they have a predictable trajectory. But of course, if there is uncertainty about the trajectory, there could be also uh, back and forth of learning the trajectory and trying to, to track it. But the main point is that we have shown that with this model, we could optimize multiple objectives, the receive power, the Doppler spread, or the delay spread. Uh, then uh, I also want to mention a work which was accepted a couple of days ago, is that uh, how, how for, this is an example of how spatial processing is changing as we are going beyond 5G. So imagine that each RIS is changing the reflection coefficients sinusoidally according to some frequency. This is not a science fiction. Actually, in Nature, there was, a, there was a paper published by physicists that showed that this is possible to do. Our role as engineers is to say, how can we use that? For example, uh, if we are having a transmission of a signal 
centered at frequency fc. When, if the, if the sinusoidal frequency here is fr, then it, then it means that the configurable intelligence surface acts as a frequency mixer. So that means that it's going to produce two new frequencies at the destination. How could you use this? Well, if you allocate unique fre uh, mixing frequency to each uh, RIS, you could actually identify from which path each, uh, each uh, ray is coming. And we are showing in this paper how, how this can be done. So the, 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 but this is bringing a, 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 another big question. How are these nonlinear elements in the environment changing the spectrum? So uh, there, there, we are finalizing a paper that, that uh, with guys working in physics to show that the meta surfaces have other nonlinear effects, which can even more change the way the spectrum is shaped by the wireless environment. And keep in mind that linearity of the wireless environment has been the basic fundamental assumption of spectrum regulation and of wireless communication systems. Finally, some words about blockchains and distributed ledgers. Besides being attractive investment vehicle these days, uh, uh, it's, it, it's interesting about how they could be purposefully used in uh, IoT systems. So when the massive IoT systems were made, originally thought as, as massive end-to-end -end systems, like 10 or more years ago, they were oriented towards uplink transmissions, uh, meaning that uh, the assumption uh, this, the assumption was that the devices have mostly uplink traffic, do not re, re, uh, need to receive much. And this is reflected in some of the mainstream massive machine type systems like LoRa and Sigfox. But there are at least two drivers to change this pattern of interaction. One is smart contracts and blockchains or distributed ledgers, which is what I'm going to talk now. And the second one is distributed learning because if these IoT devices participate in certain learning and inference tasks, then actually they need both to send and receive. And this may fundamentally change the IoT traffic in massive IoT systems. So distributed ledger is a truthful, immutable account of the history of transactions, meaning that it's a network of connected devices, which re records all the transactions that happened in the network, which node transferred which data to whom, who transferred uh, cryptocurrency to whom and so on. In reality, is a approximation of the ideal system due to the non-zero delay and the non-perfectly reliable links. And uh, the main point in distributed ledgers is that the nodes have to have a consensus about what has happened. And then this has to be written in the, in the ledger. And this consensus is, for example, originally for financial transactions but it can be generalized to smart contract. Where smart contract means that, let's say that we have sensors from different nodes measuring the pollution. So when they are measuring the pollution, each of them is reporting the pollution level. And then they all agree what was the pollution level at some point. So you cannot have, for example, somebody else coming later on and say, my pollution level was lower. So it, everything depends on what has been agreed previously. And Blockchain is a specific instance of distributed ledger with that has a linear structure. And the objective in these blockchain systems is to have finalized transactions, which means that these are accepted transactions that will not be reversed with a high probability. So if we made certain pollution uh, assessment, we are not going to have that somebody comes later on and say this was not true. So smart contracts is combining program computer functions and logic for legal documents. So you can think of smart contract as being a notary which is uh, witnessing any transaction between devices. So when you have massive amount of uh, IoT devices, of course, the smart contracts should facilitate the interactions between them. So if we have uh, cameras that are trading data with sensors, then we, can, we should have smart contracts which are telling who sent the data to whom and who's paying to whom and so on. So why should we care about this? Well, we should care because it's going to change the uh, wireless traffic and whatever the application is, we are going to uh, we, we are going to it needs to there needs to be a, a communication. So it's like in the California gold rush. Whatever whether you find or not gold, you have to use shovels. So in principle, we are doing the shovels for the communication system that might use smart contract or distributed ledgers. And uh, the, the perspective of distributed ledgers is changing 
the requirements for MMTC and URLC because in MMTC, we have simple devices that might not be equal participants of the blockchain. On the other hand, in URLC, we have defined the latency of a single transmission, but what we care in a distributed ledger is uh, the latency of the transaction. So we have to redefine the network level latency and the network level time. So we have shown in an experimental study that uh, to, to see how the current uh, uh, distributed ledgers are fitting into the current IoT systems in the LoRaWAN and the results were not good in a, in a sense that uh, the delays of the transactions were going uh, up to hundreds of minutes. The reason is that these devices like uh, LoRa, LoRa in this case is not suited for two-way transactions. And this not, not suitability, not, not, uh, not, optimum, uh, not being optimal for two-way transactions is affecting a lot what is the performance of, uh, for example, smart contracts. And I think we might see something similar in distributed learning. Uh, the thing is that NB-IoT is a technology which has more symmetric capabilities. So if this uh, smart contract pick up, then NB-IoT may be a preferred way to uh, for IoT connectivity. So uh, another example we have done in our group is uh, pollution and carbon uh, monitoring with the IoT and blockchain. So we have a setup which is showing how could you use uh, distributed ledgers from IoT devices that are doing pollution monitoring and, and having actually uh, these finalized transactions that tell what was the status at the time of, uh, at the time of measurement. To generalize this, we have also uh, considered the case of smart data trading where the IoT devices are buying and selling data through a market. So right now, IoT data goes on a market, on a data market, which is centrally uh, governed. So there are companies collecting this IoT data and they're actually selling the IoT data to third parties. The, the question is how can we make the devices individually sell and buy data uh, over, the, over the network? And we have, uh, why we, would we use that for? We are not sure, but as I said, we are making shallow. So we have actually uh, tried to benchmark what would be the communication requirements for uh, trading protocols among uh, IoT devices. So we have, uh, we have made uh, a benchmarking based on the parameters of NB-IoT. So finally, I've talked about interaction among, among uh, generic traffic types. And one of the challenges beyond 5G will be to understand the complex model uh, that show this interaction. Then uh, I hope I have convinced you that the spectrum usage needs to be redefined because of the heterogeneous requirements. We need a better understanding of the timing requirement. It's not only latency. And that there are new opportunities in spatial processing, one of the most popular, which is the reconfigurable intelligence surfaces. And uh, the distributed ledgers may fundamentally change the interactions and traffic patterns in what we call massive IoT. Thank you very much.